All right, so I asked Zach to replace your water with vodka, so hopefully you guys are enjoying that. It should be nice and calming. I don't do morning, so I gotta make sure you guys are wide awake. Okay, so what we're gonna do today is to talk a little bit about the basics of ultrasonography, just so that you guys don't look at the machine as an alien, right? I see people walk past in the ER and they see the ultrasound machine and they kind of eye it because they want it to go away from them. So I want you guys to get a little bit more comfortable with the ultrasound. We're in a day and age in medicine now where it's do more with less, right? So hospital's not gonna give us more people to work, so you have to do more things with it. As mid-levels, your job is gonna be to help the attendings out as best as possible, and some of the way to do that is to do a lot of these diagnostic studies on your own, all right? So um, the most helpful I see with the ultrasound for you guys is gonna be when it comes to abscesses. None of us wanna drain abscess at 10.30 at night before you have to go home at 11.00. And so one of the things I always do is I show the patients, we're like, look, there's nothing in there to drain, so I can't drain it, go home. Um, so for nothing else, you'll be able to use a machine to help augment some of your, um, some of your workflow in the, uh, in the department. All right, so one of the things you'll see, depending on where you work, is a different style of ultrasound machines. If you end up on the U8 side of things, I load up all those ERs with uh, Sonosite, so that would be the machine that you'd use. This is what a sonocyte looked like. This is actually the machine that I trained with when I was doing my fellowship. Uh, it's dead now. Um, but I show you this picture because I don't want you to so much memorize the machine. I want you to memorize the function, right? Because depending on the machine that you look at, the buttons are gonna be in different places and then you're gonna freak out because the machine doesn't look like the one you're used to. So memorize the function of the machine because they are the same regardless of the machine that you use. So here are our objectives for the day. Um, number two, understand ultrasound imagery. That's gonna be the big one for you guys because you wanna make sure you're getting the right picture, all right? Um, and of course, how do you anticipate bad images? How do you fix them, okay? And what are some of the things you're gonna use the ultrasound for in the emergency department? So ultrasound basically is an image just generated by an interpretation of a sound wave, okay? The military actually is what designed the ultrasound machine for us back in the days. So back in World War I and II, um, when we started getting bombed with uh, submarines, we had to find a way to detect submarines mo moving on the water. That's where the ultrasound comes from. Um, so what they used to do is they would send something called a ping. It would go through the water and it will hit the submarine, bounce back to the ship and it helps them create distance. And of course, once we finish with that, we have to convert it to another useful method and ultrasound came about. So what we do is actually we send a sound wave through tissue, all right, and it bounces back to the machine and we interpret it as an image in the form of gray dots. Depending on what it's going through, the dot might be bright, it might be dark, it might be non-existent. So think of it that way, a sound wave traveling, it's gonna hit an object, whatever that may be, liver, bone, and it bounces back to the machine and interprets it into an image. Okay, so to create that sound wave, we use electrical current to vibrate crystals in what's known as a transducer. Don't call it a probe, okay? Probe goes into the anus, the transducer actually creates an image for you. So don't call it a probe, it'll anger me. All right, so it's about 20,000 hertz is when we um, vibrate those crystals for, and we send it through a medium. Now, the biggest enemy of the ultrasound is air. So always remember that. So if you are getting a crappy image and you can't figure out why you're getting a crappy image, chances are you don't have enough gel and so you're getting a lot of air between the transducer and the tissue and that's why you're getting a bad image. So you always wanna start off there, okay? Before you start cursing, just get some more gel, plop it on the patient and then your image usually um, will, will, will improve. All right, so for the ultrasound, it's measured in Hertz okay, which is frequency per second. Why am I telling you this? Because when you go to choose your transducer, there's gonna be a number in a transducer which you're gonna to use to determine which transducer am I gonna to use to get the best image, all right? That's just something fun. I don't know why that's there. I should take it out a long time ago. All right, so these are the different machines that you'll see around, okay? So again, those of you guys who work in the UH side of things, you'll see this machine, all right? That's my Sonos site. If you work at my site, Parma, you will see this Sonosite machine, which is very fancy. This is almost like an iPad. It's all touch screen and it creates wonderful imagery. Again, don't memorize the machine, memorize the function of the machine. All right, so again, we're gonna produce a sound wave by passing electrical current through crystals that will generate a sound that will go into the tissue. All right, 
The crystals are located at the end of the transducer, and that is one of the main reasons why you don't want to drop the transducer. Because if you break the crystals, then the transducer is no longer valid. It's not good, all right? And if you break the crystals, then I'm going to have to end up breaking you. All right. So, when the military first started using this, they used naturally occurring quartz. Well, we don't have enough quartz in the world for all the ultrasound machines that are out there. So we now have a synthetic um, uh, crystal, which we call um, the piezoelectric uh, crystal. And that's what at the end of the ultrasound. And they do fracture, okay? All right, so how does one get the image? Well, depending on how far the sound wave is going to go, the image is going to be bouncing back. So quite simply, if you walk two blocks towards the grocery store, one must assume you're going to walk two blocks back to come home. All right? So if you are trying to ultrasound, for example, the gallbladder, and you put your transducer over the right upper quadrant, all right, first thing is going to go through the skin. Then depending on how fluffy the patient is, a lot of adipose tissue. Then it's going to hit the liver, and then it's going to go through into the gallbladder. All right? So you think about it that way, depending on how big our patient is, it depends on how far that sound wave has to travel to get to the liver to bounce back to the machine to create an image for you, all right? <clears throat> so essentially, each sound wave that goes is going to create a dot reference, all right? So if you think about it this way, if I put the transducer over my liver, the sound wave, the dot that's coming back from the skin is going to be brighter, right, because it's the closest, and it's going to be brighter than the dot that's coming back from the gallbladder because it's the deepest. Does that make sense? All right? So there you are. So the dots here, this is the transducer right here, all right? And let's say what you're looking for is down here. As you can see, as the sound travels through, depending on when it bounces back, it's going to have a brightness. This is the closest object to the transducer, so this is nice and bright. And of course, this is further away, so this is going to be more gray. That's just the image itself. That has nothing to do with what the sound has to travel through. Does it have to go through bone? Does it have to hide behind a rib? It doesn't matter. That's just the image itself, all right? So there we are. This is how we create our image. So electrical current comes in. The crystals are here. We vibrate the crystals, and it sends the sound wave out through the tissue. And of course, so you have one dot representing here, one dot representing here. So if you have a sound wave traveling through this organ, for example, the dots representing the upper surface of the organ is going to be brighter than the dots representing the lower uh, portion of the organ. Does that make sense to you guys? All right, because it's further distance it has to go. And we're going to talk about some things that you're going to find that's going to uh, change your image. When I was first started in ultrasound, one of the most confusing things for me is, how do I interpret this image on the screen? It seems very simple, but it didn't click for me until I could realize, what the hell am I looking at? So I like to put this picture there because as simple as it is, it really helps a lot. So here is the transducer, all right? And there is the image that comes out. And what you want to do basically is you pick up this little triangular image and you plop it on the screen, all right? And we help to guide where we're going because at the end of the transducer, you guys will see this later on this afternoon, there is an indicator on the side of the transducer, all right? And that must always be pointing towards the patient's right or towards the patient's head because it will correspond to the image that you see here, all right? So your indicator is here and here on the transducer. So it tells you that the image here is going to be on this side of the screen, and the image here is going to be on that side of the screen. Does that make sense to you guys? And so you say to yourself, self, why the hell do I need to know that? Well, one of the hardest things that you have to do when you start ultrasounding is not looking at the patient, and it's very anti what we're used to. All right? When I teach the nurses to do um, ultrasound-guided IVs, that is the hardest thing for them because you're used to looking at the patient. Well, when you're scanning a patient, you're not looking at them at all, all right? Sometimes you don't even know what they look like until you're done because you're looking at the screen. And as you move the transducer up and down or right and left, you gotta be able to track on the screen what you're looking at, okay? So if your transducer is not in the proper location, you're gonna miss exactly what you're looking for here. Why is that helpful? Well, if you're trying to drain an abscess, all right, and the abscess happens to be close to a vessel, if you don't really know where you are and you get blindsided, you're going to put that needle through the vessel and bad things are going to happen, all right? You'll find that extremely useful when you're doing a central line placement because you want to know, for example, in central line, 
where the hell is the carotid? All right, because it's very embarrassing when you have to call a vascular surgeon because you dilated the carotid artery at 2 a.m. They get very angry. <clears throat> All right, so just remember this. There's your image, represents a screen. You're gonna have a little indicator there. And the indicator is different depending on the machine. Again, don't memorize the machine. All right, on some of the Sonosite machine, it's a green dot. On some machines, you'll actually see a symbol. Just know it corresponds to the indicator on the transducer, all right? All right, all different types of machines, all different types of transducers. This is what we used to start off with, this giant old-fashioned machine. All right, you work in some parts of the country. Um, that's actually what the machines still look like. And they still work, all right? But nowadays, you'll see in some EDs, you'll see folks walking around with these handheld um, ultrasound machines and little transducers. And again, they do work. All right, so again, it's not a probe. If I were to pick one of these to be a probe, this would be it. This is the one that goes in the anus, all right? But the rest of them, they're all transducers. Don't memorize the shape of the transducer because it's irrelevant, all right? You have to memorize the frequency of the transducer, which is a number that's written on the, the transducer itself. And we'll talk about how you choose transducers in a minute. So most folks will say, oh, this is the one I used to look at organs. Not true, all right? You gotta look at the number and know the frequency of the transducer. Most of the time, when you look, the vascular transducers do look like this. But again, this could also be one that we use for solid organs. So don't memorize the shape of the transducer. Memorize the frequency. And we'll talk about how you pick those, okay? Um, you also wanna pick your transducer based on what you're looking at. So if I'm doing something in the chest, I need a transducer with a small footprint that I can dodge between ribs, right? Whereas if I'm looking at the abdomen, I don't really care how big the transducer is. So this small footprint here, and there's a small footprint there, that's where my image is coming from. I would choose these if I'm doing something in the chest because I can hide it through the ribs and find what I'm looking for um, quite well. All right, so. This is how our image is produced. Here's your transducer. <clears throat> and we send a sound wave out, all right? And as the sound wave goes out, you notice the size of the arrow is changing, and that tells you that you're losing power. Imagine, if you are walking to the store and the store is two blocks away, all right? You're gonna do that quickly versus if the store is a mile away. As you go down towards the mile away store, you're gonna get tired, right? And you have to walk a mile back. So you can think about the image, what it's gonna look like when you have to go further away from the transducer itself. So as the, the sound goes out, it's gonna travel through a different medium, okay? Again, thinking of my liver. As I'm scanning over my liver, the first medium I'm gonna go through is gonna be the gel, obviously, all right? Then it's gonna be the skin. Then depending on how fluffy the patient is, you're gonna go through tissue adipose tissue, and then you're gonna hit organs, all right? And one knows that the density of the liver is different from the density of adipose tissue, all right? So you're gonna lose more of the sound going in. You haven't even gotten your image yet. This is just the sound going down to the liver, and as it goes down, you're gonna lose more and more depending on what you're going through, and that is called basically acoustic impedance. So it has to do with the density of tissue that the sound is going through. And if I say that to you right away, you could just say, oh, well, bone obviously is gonna be denser than the liver, right? So the, mo the greatest acoustic impedance when you're scanning is gonna be bone. So if you're looking at something in the lungs, for example, you wanna see if there's fluid in the lungs, you have to make sure your transducer is not placed over a rib because a rib is bone and bone has the greatest acoustic impedance, right? So you wanna avoid that as best as possible. Likewise, if you're looking for your kidney in the right upper quadrant or the left upper quadrant, you wanna go below the costal margin because you know there's no ribs down there, all right? So you wanna think about that, all right? The greater the acoustic impedance, the more of your sound you're gonna lose. That makes sense, right? All right, and then now, as you think about, again, going back down to that grocery store, as you walk towards the grocery store, there's gonna be things that are gonna get into your way. It's gonna affect how quickly you get to the grocery store, how tired you are when you get there because you have to walk back. Same thing with the sound wave, all right? As you're sending your image out, sending the sound wave out, there's gonna be a lot of things that are gonna affect that sound wave before it even gets to the organ, and it's gonna determine how well your image looks like when it's coming back. One of those things is called reflection, all right? As the tissue, as the sound wave goes through the tissue, some of the, the sound wave is gonna be reflected. It's gonna be reflected away, all right? And there's nothing one can do about that. Next one is gonna be refraction, and that's actually the bending of the sound. 
as you go through different mediums, all right? The next thing is gonna be transmission, and then finally, attenuation. Attenuation is the one that's gonna bother you the most. This is basically tells you that the uh, strength of the sound is gonna be lost, depending on how deep one has to go, all right? This has to do with body habitus, all right? So if you get a patient that's small, that weighs about 45 kilos, all right, you're gonna get much better image than if you are scanning a patient that weighs, say, 175 kilos, all right? So bear that in mind. If you walk in the room and your patient takes up the entire ER bed, you're gonna get a bad image. Nothing you can do about it, all right? But if you walk in the room and they take up 50% of the bed, you're gonna get a better image from them. All right, so reflection again. Here's your transducer. Here's your sound wave going down, heading towards the tissue, and some of it's gonna be reflected back, all right? So there's what we call reflected echoes. As you can see, this is the liver, in case you guys didn't know. It's a pretty healthy looking liver, all right? So here's the transducer here, a little bit of skin, some adipose tissue, and a hit organ. So this patient is not that fluffy because you can see organ right away. Not a lot of things going on between the transducer and the image that you want to see, all right? You head on the way down and there's gonna be the uh, covering of the liver, all right? And if you look at this image, you can say, hmm, I can tell right away that this is gonna be denser than the liver tissue itself, right? Because it is brighter. It's a brighter signal than here. And if you look, you can say there's no signal coming from here, so we know that there's no acoustic impedance here whatsoever, all right? And that's how we can tell different things that we're looking at, okay? All of this is gonna be different shades of gray, not 50, but just different shades of gray, all right? And then, of course, next we're gonna get uh, reflected echoes, all right? So if nothing is reflected, we're gonna get a black dot. That's gonna be your fluid, all right? Again. Not all fluid is the same, okay? Urine, bile, blood, they'll all look about the same level of gray dots. But if one were to have an abscess that is nice and thick, you know those ones that you drain them and you just like shiver because it's amazing, all right? Nice, big, thick pus, or if you have clotted blood, it's gonna be a different shade of, of black. It's gonna be a little grayish blackish, all right? So that's how you can tell what you're looking at. But for the most part, what we're looking for is cystic fluid, urine, blood, is gonna be what we call hypoechoic or echo-free, all right? The sound just goes right through it. Nothing is reflected back because there's nothing for it to hit off. But if you start to get bits inside of the fluid itself, like tissue and so forth, then you're gonna to have to have some things bouncing back and forth, all right? So there we are. So as you can see here, all right, there's a solid organ. There's a transducer here, all right? This is a nice cystic structure with something in it, all right? Depends on where you are. So if this is the kidney, which it isn't, but if it were the kidney, one could say this is probably a cystic structure, all right? If this were the neck, one would say this is a blood vessel. It all depends on where you are and what you're looking at, okay? You have one structure there, another structure there, all right? And you have different shades of structure in here. So if you were looking, for example, at clotted blood, this is what it would look like. And if you're looking at fresh blood, that's what it would look like. Does that make sense? All right, so obviously this is now the neck because I'm telling you it's the neck, all right? Transducer is here, some tissue there, all right? There's, this is muscle, and this is gonna be a vessel, and that is gonna be a vessel. And based on what we learn in anatomy, we'll know that this is a juggler, and this would be the carotid. See how useful this is? Because if you're putting a central line in this patient, and you want to do blind placement, we know most of the time our juggler lies side by side to the carotid, but in this patient, it does not, all right? The juggler is on top. So if you didn't use the ultrasound, you'd put your needle all the way through into the carotid, and then you have to call the thoracic surgeon at 4 a.m. and get yelled at, all right? Okay, all right, <clears throat> moving along. Again, don't forget your acoustic impedance, all right? Those are the things that are gonna get in the way of your image, and you wanna reduce them as best as possible. The one that you control is air. And you control that by putting more gel on the patient, all right? So you can't just lick the transducer and start scanning the patient. You're not gonna get a good image, all right? And you probably shouldn't lick the transducer anyway. All right, so reflection. 
Refraction is going to be the next one. And this is basically the bending of the, of the, um, of the sound wave, okay? And it all depends on the tissue that it's going through. You look at this, and it looks like a physics uh, image. So I'm just going to move on so I don't freak you out, okay? All right. Transmission is going to be the next, okay? And transmission basically means that when you get to the image that you're looking for, the sound wave is still going to keep going, all right? And there's nothing you can do about that. You just want to make sure that the dots that are coming back with your image, all right, is what you want. And how do you optimize your image so it looks great, so you don't worry too much about um, transmission, is you change the depth, all right? So if I'm looking for something and I can see it right away, what do I care about what's down here, all right? So you reduce your depth, okay, and you get a better image that way, okay? So that's how you're going to fix that. And then finally, attenuation. All right, and again, this you can see is just like I say, if you're gonna walk a mile to the store versus two blocks, you're gonna be more tired when you get to the end of, uh, of the mile versus the end of two blocks. And this is just showing you the strength of the sound as you go deeper into the body, all right, it's gonna be affected. So if the organ that you're looking for is here, you're gonna have a beautiful image, right? But if the organ that you're looking for is down here, it's not gonna be the best, okay? And how do you help to fix this? By choosing the right transducer. And we'll talk about that in a minute, okay? So you're gonna lose some of your signal depending on what you're looking through. So again, the one that affects us the most is air. So when you're looking for an image in the chest, one can anticipate you're gonna get crappy imagery, all right? And you're gonna do the best you can to reduce that by using more gel, okay? And if you're looking for something in the abdomen, of course, um, it's gonna be much better. As you can see, you lose the less attenuation when it comes to water, okay? And this is useful because there are times when you can image a body part by immersing it in water. So for example, if I'm using the ultrasound to find a fracture in a kid, okay? I'll take the little kid, I don't like children by the way, in case you guys don't know that. So I'll grab the little kid and I'll shove its arm in a bowl of uh, water and then I'll put the transducer in there. I don't need gel. All right, I just put the transducer right over, the, over the, uh, the digit and you'll be able to see the fracture. All right, you can't immerse a large human being into water because it's just not good. All right, so how do we choose a transducer? It's very simple. Um, if you think about it, you have two types of runners, right? You have long distance runners and you have sprinters. That makes sense? So, so what, do, what do we know about long distance runners versus sprinters? Well, sprinters can go very short distances, very fast, and they're very good at it, right? Long distance runners, they go longer distance. It doesn't go, they don't go very fast, but they can go for a long time. That's the same way you're gonna choose your transducer. If you're looking for an object that's superficial, you wanna use a transducer that's fast. Basically, a higher frequency transducer, okay? You'll see the number on the transducer when you pick it up. You'll see some numbers. And just like ID catheters and NG tubes, the numbers don't make sense. So you'll see a number on the transducer that will say, 18-12, and then you'll see another number that says 3-5, all right? That is the frequency of the transducer. And they put the highest number first and, as, and the lowest number next. Don't ask them why they do that. I don't care, but it works. So you choose a transducer based on what you're looking for. If I am looking at an abscess that's on the surface of the skin that I can almost see, but I just want to know if it's, you know, cobblestoning or if there's actual pus in there so I can enjoy my... IND, then I'm gonna use a fast transducer or a high frequency transducer. If I'm putting in an IV, if I'm doing a central line, I'm gonna use my high frequency fast transducer. So I'll choose the 18-12, all right? When I'm looking for a gallbladder, all right? If I'm looking for a parasite inside of a woman's uterus, then I'm gonna use the slower transducer or the one that's gonna go deeper, right? That's gonna be my long distance runner. So I would choose the 5-3, does that make sense? Lower the number, slower, further it's gonna go. All right, so solid organs, choose a transducer that goes deep, low number. Superficial structures, choose your transducer that's gonna go very fast, so your higher frequency. That's the basic thing to, um, to think about, okay? And if you, ever, um, if you ever think that you chose the wrong transducer, it will let you know because you won't see crap when you put the transducer on. So if I choose the 5-3 transducer to do a central line, what am I gonna see? Nothing, all right? 
So you'll freak out, and you think you did something wrong, and you just start pushing buttons. Just choose a different transducer, and you'll see exactly what you want to see. And you'll go through that this evening, this afternoon, when you do um, the practical next door. All right. So this is basically a summary of what I just said. All right. The higher the frequency, the better the resolution, right? Because sprinters, very fast, don't go very far, and they're very good at it, versus the lower frequency transducer, the less the resolution, i.e. the less, the better, the worse picture you're going to get. So these are going to be your slow, long distance runners that can go very far, but you're not going to get the best imagery. Make sense? All right. So we'll talk about this already. 12 megahertz, higher number, faster, better image. Low megahertz, smaller number, goes very far, not the best image. All right? So now, you say to yourself, self, I have to scan this person. There's nothing I can do about the fact that she's 450 pounds or he's 450 pounds. But I'm going to try and see the gallbladder. I know it's going to be difficult because I walked in the room, I introduced myself to the patient, and they're taking up 100% of the ER bed. Right? So I know it's going to be a bad image. So, but I got to scan the patient anyway. So you go in and you said, well, this is a fluffy patient, so I need a low-frequency transducer that can go very far through a lot of tissue. But I know I'm going to lose a lot of my sound because I have a lot of tissue to go through just to get to my gallbladder. All right? So how can I best get my image? Well, the two things that we can um, control on the ultrasound machine is going to be um, the gain and the attenuation. All right? Because what you really would like to do is to increase the power of the transducer. All right? So back in the days, we used to allow scanners to change the power, all right, of the transducer, but literally turn the power up in the transducer. And then, you know, after a few fires and a few electrocutions, we decided it wasn't a good idea. So we took that away from you guys. You're not allowed to change the power anymore. But you can change the gain and you can fix the attenuation. What exactly is the gain? Well, it's just like turning up the volume of a stereo, all right? So I always tell folks, if you're you know, getting ready for work and you listen to your Justin Bieber in the shower and you can't hear because the shower is so loud, what do you do? You turn up the volume of the radio, right? Now you can turn the volume up as high as you want, but what happens to the quality of the sound as you turn your volume up? It gets worse, right? So by the time you go from 5 to 12 on your volume button, when you get to 12, you can't hear much, a lot of sound. Well, the same thing happens to the ultrasound, all right? So you can control the gain. And you say, well, what exactly is controlling the gain? It's basically allowing the ultrasound to listen longer. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. Anybody here take pictures, camera, any photographers, any amateur photographers? No? Jesus, what do you guys do? You guys are boring. But anyway, if you take a photo with a non-automatic camera, one of the things you adjust is you adjust the lens and you adjust the aperture, the opening. So if you're in a dark room, Right? You leave the, op the aperture open longer so you can allow more light to come in, so you can get a better picture. Same thing with ultrasound. So if I turn up the gain, I allow the ultrasound to listen longer for that sound coming back. Well, the problem with allowing that to happen is all kinds of crap is going to come back. So you're going to get your image, but you're going to get a lot of crap with it. Sometimes there's stuff you can do about it. Sometimes there isn't. All right? But you want to fix the gain so you can get a better image. All right? So as you're losing uh, the sound wave to the tissue, you allow the ultrasound to stay in a listening mode longer so that more, it waits longer for the sound to come back home. All right? Because it's going so far into deep tissue. So again, the more tissue you have to penetrate, the more signal you're going to lose. That makes sense, right? So we have. Again, don't memorize the buttons on the machine, but this is what you can fix. You can fix the near field or the far field. I'll show you what I'm talking about. On the ultrasound, there's a button called gain, all right? Most ultrasound will have three buttons. One will be the far gain, one will be the near gain, and one will be the overall gain, okay? Depending on what part of the image you want to fix. On some of the more automated uh, iPad-like machines, you will have multiple section of gain. They'll have like five. So you can do near, middle, far, really, really far, okay? But bottom line is, adjust the gain to get a better image, all right? So as you increase the gain, the gray dots are going to get brighter, and as you decrease the gain, the gray dots are going to get darker. 
So when you're trying to fine tune the image of that abscess, you will actually fine tune the grayness so you can get a better image, okay? Here's what we're talking about. So here you have, this is what you're, you're aiming for, all right? Nice liver, nice kidney, all right? This is a nice image, okay? You can see all the different bits inside of the liver, all right? You can see the liver capsule there, and you're happy with this image. But when you first started scanning the patient, this is what you got. And what do you see? You can see the kidney quite nicely. You can see the far portion of the liver, but you can't really see what's going on here. This is a bad near field, and you can adjust the gain. This would be adjusting the near gain to get this image. Over here, you have a bad far field. You can't really see the kidney very well. I'm not getting a nice liver capsule. I'm not getting the distal portion of the liver right here. I need to adjust the far gain, all right? And that will bring my image here. Again, talking to you about this and you doing it are two different things. And you play it this afternoon in the lab and you'll see what I'm talking about. Just mess with the gain and you'll see how it changes the image. All right, so this is one thing that you are in control of. So you can control your attenuation. How do we do that? With gel, all right? And you can control your um, acoustic impedance as best as you can by choosing the right transducer. And then of course you can fix your gain to get a better image, all right? That is correct, yep. Mm -hmm. All right, so reflections. Strong reflections, you get a little bit of white dots, okay? So your bone is gonna be white, diaphragm, tendons. If you have a nicely walled off abscess, you can actually see the capsule of the abscess, it'll be nice and white, okay? Um, and that's actually what we call hyperechoic. So you have hypoechoic, which is really, really dark dots. You have hyperechoic, which is bright dots. And so you know exactly what you're looking at. And so when I told you I took the little kid and shoved its hand in the water, basically as I look, what I'm looking for is, is there a tendon rupture? Because I can see the tendon and I can see the bone. I can see that you'd be a nice white line and if there's a break in the line, that's your fracture. All right, if you're looking at a tendon, like for example, if you think this person ruptured the Achilles tendon or the triceps tendon, you put the transducer over it and you look for a break in that nice white line and that tells you that they have a, um, a tendon rupture. So you're looking for hyperechoic images, all right? So there we are. So you have a little transducer here, got some skin there. Here is your tendon. There you go, well, how do I know it's a tendon? Well, one, I'm telling you it's a tendon. But two, a tendon basically looks like a busy day on the expressway. Lots of little cars. And imagine if you turn that up and make it go real fast, like cars are flying by you, that's what tendons look like. So there are your little cars there, all right? There's the outer sheet of the tendon there, and another one there, all right? And so if one were to rupture the tendon, you would actually see a nice break. And you can see if it's partial or not. So what you'll see is you'll see black line through the tendon. And you'll see it's nice and separated. And it might be jagged, look like a bite or something like that. But if you see it go all the way through, then that will be a complete tear. And if you see it goes halfway through, then there'll be a partial tear. Does that make sense? So another thing that you can do, rather than wait for, um, wait for ultrasound to come in and get it done for you. All right, so <clears throat> what are the uses for you guys in the ED? Well, you have a lot of ultrasound guided procedures that one must do, all right? If you're gonna put in a central line, you must use ultrasound, all right? It is a CMS requirement to use ultrasound guidance. You can't do blind sticks anymore. So if you wanna play cowboy and you said, oh, I can actually see the juggler from here, I'm not using ultrasound, that's fine. All right, but just know you're violating CMS protocol. So what happens now when you dilate the carotid because you didn't use ultrasound? Well, you're gonna actually get yourself in some trouble, right? Because you, ha you can't defend yourself. No, a lawyer can't go and say, oh, well, you know, my client was very good at doing blind sticks and so they did a blind stick and oops, we messed up. No, it's ultrasound guided requirements. So you must do that, all right? We're getting to the point where you have to do abscesses now are gonna be ultrasound guided. But it's not required yet, okay? But the more you can use it, the, the less complications one's gonna have. So if I do a central line and I decided not to use my ultrasound and I drop their lungs, for example, then that's gonna be it, okay? Then I'm gonna lose my license, go to jail, and become someone's prison bitch. So just make sure that you guys are using the machine for ultrasound guiding uh, requirements, okay? All right, so here are some of the images that we're gonna work through, all right? Again, 
if you don't know what you're looking at, the normal anatomy, you're not going to know if it's abnormal. If you don't know what a juggler is, you could have the transducer over the neck all day long. You won't know what you're looking at. All right? If you have a very thin person and you put a transducer over the neck, you have to know that the external juggler is going to be on top of the internal juggler, and then the carotid is going to be somewhere around there. If you don't know that, you're going to get lost. If you don't know when you're going to write up a quadrant that you're going to see the liver first and then the gallbladder, you will never find the gallbladder because you don't know the normal anatomy. If you're doing a fast exam and you put the transducer on the left upper quadrant, if you don't know that the spleen is over here, it's not the liver, you're going to call this the liver, right? And you're going to be wrong. So you got to know your basic anatomy and you got to know what's normal. So that way you can tell things that are abnormal. So here we are. This is, your transducer is going to be here, all right? This is the epidermis. You will know that, all right? This is going to be your fascia covering your muscle layer. So if you have anything in here, you're going to know that this is going to be a superficial abscess or a foreign body or whatever the case may be, all right? This is your muscle layer. So if you look through here and you see an abscess, then you're going to know that's going to be an intramuscular abscess, all right? And of course, here's your bony interface, and you're not going to see much after here. Why? Because this is bone. And what happens when a signal hits bone? It's all going to be reflected back, right? Because the sound wave can't go through the bone. That's why you have nothing but darkness here, okay? If this were a finger, this would be a very fat finger, but if it were a finger and you were trying to look for a fracture, you would see a break in this little hazy line here, all right? Muscle tear, you'd see a black line going through here, all right? And of course, abscesses or laceration, you'd see there. All right? Again, highway, lots of traffic going very, very fast, that's a tendon looks different from this, that's not very organized, this is muscle. See the difference? Muscle, tendon, nice and smooth. If you were to rupture the um, pollicis longus tendon, you would see a break through the tendon of sheath there. All right, there's a muscle belly above it, okay? And of course, bony interface down here. All the signals reflected, so nothing but black under here, all right? As you look at this image, one of the things that you could do to maximize this image is you could change the depth. There's a button on the machine that changes your depth, and you'll see the corresponding depth on the side. It's in centimeters, just so you guys know. So this is two centimeters deep, okay? The structure I'm looking for is about a third of the way up, all right, so about three quarters of a centimeter is where my tendon would be. Why is that helpful? Well, if I were draining an abscess, and if this were not a tendon, but if the abscess was here, then I need to know that this is about one centimeter, and I need to know what size needle that I should choose, okay? If I were trying to do a uh, ultrasound guided IV, for example, and I can see my vessel here, then I know that's about a quarter centimeters down, versus if my vessel is here, I'm making this up, it's not here. So don't look for the vessel, it's not there. You're not crazy. But if the vessel were here, I would know that this is closer to two centimeters and I know what size IV catheter to use. All right, so that's how the depth is gonna help you. Here's a nice abscess. Is this ripe and juicy and ready to drain? No, it's not. This is what we call cobblestoning. All right, looks like the back alleys in Italy. All right, so this is an abscess. This is a transducer here. There's your epidermis there. All right, you start to see some of your muscular interface down here. So I know this is a superficial abscess, but it's not ready yet. It's not ripe. All right, you got a little bit of fluid there. Here's your pus there. Got a little bit of pus collection there. So if you want to go in with your needle and stab this poor patient nine times, draining each of these, it's up to you, but I guarantee you, your press gain the score is going to be crap. All right? So this just tells you, you can show the patient and go, you know, this is not really ready to be drained yet. Come back when all of this is nice and big and black, because it's a nice pocket of pus that will make you happy, all right? Remember I talk about the indicator of the patient? That's what I'm talking about, that little green dot there, all right? So if this were a chest wall, for example, then I would know that this is closer to the patient's head, and this would be closer to the patient's feet, right? Because the transducer has to be pointed towards the head or to the patient's right. Does that make sense? All right. Come on. 
There we go. There's a nice juicy abscess, all right? So again, this is helpful. I got my transducer here, all right? And look at that. Mm -mm -mm. You know you're going to get some good pus out of there, all right? Now, we can say from this that there's a lot of proteinaceous material in the abscess, right? Because remember we said if it's just clear urine or cystic fluid, it's going to be nice and black. I like how they dimmed the light. I felt like I was going to bed. It's just nice and soothing. All right, but here's one thing that can be helpful. You can know if you want to do ultrasound guidance here, you will avoid putting your needle in this blood vessel right there, okay? And you can see this is filled with blood. It's nice and black and hypoechoic, okay? And this, not so much. So you notice it has some proteinaceous material in it because there's something in it that is reflecting sound and giving you an image, right? If this was pure uh, fluid filled with nothing else in it, it would look like this. There's nothing in it to reflect sound, so you don't get an image. This has proteinaceous, proteinaceous material in it because it's giving you some reflections. So you know this is gonna be nice, thick, juicy pus, right? This is good stuff. All right, so if you wanted to do a, a, a needle drainage in this one instead of cutting it open, you could. All right, you check your depth, of course, pick your needle size and go straight into the center of the abscess. I would probably give the patient a little lidocaine if I were you. Um, and then you just drain out the abscess there and you can kind of see it kind of go away. It's really, really cool. All right, so what else do we use it for? Well, for those of you who are gonna work at a trauma center, it is now required. All right, we're talking about ultrasound requirement. It is required for you to do a FAST exam on the patient. FAST stands for Focus Assessment with Sonography for Trauma. And what it does, it replaces something called a DPL, Diagnostic Peritoneal Lavage. You guys know what that is? You shouldn't, hopefully, all right? Very barbaric, barbaric way that we would tell back in the days if a trauma patient had um, intra-abdominal hemorrhage, okay? So, the place where I trained and did my ultrasound fellowship, the trauma director there is old school and she hated ultrasound, all right? To her, the ultrasound machine was like her ex-husband, is what she told me. I don't have no idea what that means. Um, <clears throat> but she hated the ultrasound. And she hated when I was in the room. She's like, get the thing out of here. But DPL basically is, they would take a liter bag of saline, they would take an 18-gauge needle and stab the patient in the abdomen, all right? And then they would squeeze the fluid into the patient and then they'll turn the bag upside down and gravity, the fluid will run out. And if it turned red, guess what? You're bleeding and you're going to the OR. Well, for those of you all know, if you take one drop of blood and drop it in a bowl of water, it looks like you're hemorrhaging to death, right? Because once you break open the cells, you can't tell if it is 100 cc's of blood in the abdomen or 10 cc's. Well, with ultrasound, you kind of can. So with focus assessment of trauma is you look at four places in the body for bleeding, all right? And this is dependent on gravity and hemorrhage. Patient's laying flat, okay? If they're bleeding, blood will collect in the retroperitoneal spaces. Make sense? So how about we scan certain parts of the body and look for blood? And that's exactly what we do. It takes about 500 cc's of blood in the abdomen to get a positive FAST exam. So if your FAST exam is positive, you know there's at least a half a liter of blood in your abdomen, all right? So if you come in, and you were unfortunate enough to get stabbed at four in the morning while you were going to church, all right? And you got stabbed, and you come in and you have a positive fast exam, and you're hypotensive, we're done. You're going to the OR. You have a positive fast exam, you're hypotensive, you're bleeding. End of story, all right? So we want to look at four parts of the body to look for positive blood. You look in Morrison's pouch. You guys remember Morrison's pouch? Yes. Right upper quadrant, all right? And it's basically you're looking between the liver and the kidney, hepatorenal space, all right? And then we do the same thing on the left side, the perisplenic uh, space. It doesn't have a fancy name like Morrison's. I should make one up and become famous. All right, and then of course, the pelvic cul-de-sac, the so-called pouch of Douglas in women. Men, sorry, you don't have a pouch. Um, but women, this is gonna be the space between your uterus and your bladder. That's where your blood would collect. All right, and then of course, we look at the pericardium. Because if you're hypotensive, maybe you have pericardial tamponade. We don't know. Oh, this image looks like crap now. But anyway, this is where one would put, uh, put the transducer. And you can see this fine gentleman was on his way to church, um, ended up getting into a trauma position. So the first spot you want to look is between intercostal space 11 and 12. That's where you're going to put the transducer. You're going to have to move it around a bit so that you don't get messed up by the ribs, right? We don't want bone in our way. Because what happened to the sound when it hits bone? 100% reflected, right? So you're not going to get an image. 
So you want to you want to pick your transducer. All right, this is going to be one of the lower frequency transducers. So something about like 8-6 or 5-3, low frequency, not the high frequency ones. All right, place the transducer between the costal space 11 and 12. Again, the indicator must be towards the patient's right or towards the patient's head. All right, that's the first place you want to look, and you want to look for blood. And there it is. There's your liver. All right, there's the transducer. And there's a, there's a kidney, and this is the hepatorenal space, and there's blood right there, all right? Black, hypoechoic. And let's say, for example, this person um, got injured about 15 hours ago, okay? Or let's just say 24 hours, right? They went home, 24 hours later, um, they show up in the emergency department complaining of uh, abdomen, abdominal pain, and you do a fast exam, and let's say you get this image, and instead of black, you have this weird little fuzzy image in here. Would that be a positive fast exam? Yeah, it's clotted blood. Remember we said when blood sits around in clots, it starts to almost look like tissue. It doesn't quite look like this, nor does it look like this, but there's definitely something between both spaces here, and it's probably clotted blood. All right, and if they're not hypotensive, you can send them off and get a CAT scan or whatever, but if they're hypotensive, you know you have a positive fast exam. So that's the first spot that one's gonna look. Then you wanna move over to the other side of the body. So remember, you're standing on the patient's right. You scan the right upper quadrant, all right? And then you go over to the left upper quadrant. And I'll tell you a hint. The spleen is a little further retroperitoneal than the liver, all right? So when you go over to, you put your hand over the patient, if they're not too wide for you. You put your hand over the patient to scan on the uh, left side. Make sure your hand touches the cot. So if your hand touches the bed, you're gonna be in the right position. But if your hand is hovering up here, you're gonna to have to mess around a bit to find the image that you look for. And this is gonna be the um, spleen here, and then your kidneys, all right? Oops, no, oh, sorry, wrong, wrong one. This is liver still. This is a very positive fast scan, lots of blood. It's about two liters of blood here, squishing the kidney down, all right? So, perisplenic view, hand over the patient. This guy is kind of out of position. So I would put this hand and touch the bed, and then work your way up and then you'll find your image better that way, all right? Spleen is a little higher up than liver, so intercostal space 10 and 11 is where one is gonna put um, the transducer, all right? And of course, there's your image there. Tiny little spleen, there's the blood there, and there is kidney there, all right? If you get really good at this, sometimes you'll actually see the splenic capsule going around the spleen, and you see a little bit of black in it, that's probably a spleen lack. All right, so you see a spleen laceration, you'll actually see fresh blood in there. Okay, so bear that in mind. Talk about how, uh, if you look a little higher, you can also possibly see blood, like, you know, pearl Correct, like correct. Here's your diaphragm gonna be up there, all right? And so if the patient's laying down at the posterior portion of the body, you can see blood in the chest as well. There we are, spinorenal, all right. There's a diaphragm, okay, lots of blood there. And the good thing about the FAST exam is when it's positive, it's positive. You don't have to guess and go, mm, maybe, I think, you're gonna see it. It's gonna be very positive, all right. The sub xiphoid view, this is gonna give you the cardiac view. This is probably the one that people have the most difficulty with. All right, because it's very body habitus dependent, and you really feel like you're hurting the patient, all right, but you're, you're, you're really not, but you almost lay the transducer flat, all right, and you, and you image up towards the heart. It would be very nice if all of our patients look like this, but we know they don't, okay? This is the view you're looking for, all right? So this is a, this is a great image, because what you want when you look here is, you don't want a lot of liver in your view when you're doing the sub xiphoid view, because you're trying to get the cardiac view. And you go, this looks very confusing. Well, remember, the heart sits in the chest like this. All right, transducer is here. So the first thing you're gonna hit is gonna be the right side of the heart. Does that make sense? It looks confusing, but it's not. All right, transducer there. All right, the first part of the heart you're gonna see is the right side of the heart. And the furthest portion is gonna be the left side of the heart. And you just label that, all right? Right side of the heart, right ventricle, right atrium. What are these for 500 points? What are these? What's between the right ventricle and the right atrium? 
tricuspid valve, yes. Left ventricle here, left atria there, and this valve would be the mitral valve, fantastic. And when you get really fancy, um, you can put Doppler color flow on here, and you can look for mitral regurg and stuff like that, but don't freak yourself out. Just learn how to realize that this is the right side of the heart, this is the left side of the heart. And this is the pericardium, all right? And if one has bleeding or blood in the pericardial sac, you'll see it, which we'll see in a minute here. While we're here, what is this thing right here? This is the interventricular septum, all right? So if you have a patient that comes in and they tell you that they had um, surgery on their knee about three weeks ago and they got up to go pee and now they're significantly short of breath and they come in and they look terrible, pulse ox is hovering around 85, 89%, all right? And they just look awful and they tell you they have this vague chest discomfort. What do they got? They got a PE. All right, and you say to yourself, or oh, self, I wonder how big this PE is because they really look crappy. And the blood pressure is 100 systolic. You plot the ultrasound on here, and what you see is a huge right ventricle, a tiny left ventricle, and this bad boy here is coming like this into the left ventricle. That's called bowing, the bowing of the septum. So this is nice and flat right now, and if you have a massive PE, blood can't get from the um, right ventricle to the lungs, so it starts to pick up and collect in here, and you dilate your right ventricle, and you'll see bowing at the septum. And you go, aha, I am gonna bet my lunch money that this person has a massive PE, all right? And then if you wanna get brave, you can call your surgeons in and tell them they have a PE, and they'll yell at you, and then they'll get the CT, and then an hour later, you'll prove them right, and you'll have a little smile on your face, all right? <clears throat> okay, so you can't see this very well, but this is right atria, okay? You can see, you can barely see the right ventricle here. And this is a, a, a large uh, ventricle, left ventricle here. And a lot of fluid around it. A lot of fluid around the heart. What is this? So if you ever walk up to me and show me this and go, hey, this guy's got tamponade, what do you think is going to happen? Probably going to punch you in the face. All right? You can never use ultrasound to diagnose tamponade. You can't do it. Cardiac tamponade is a clinical diagnosis. You can say this patient has a very large pericardial effusion, and I'll believe you, but you can't tell me this patient's got tamponade. What you can say is, you can say, listen, I got this guy. He's short of breath. His EKG looks like crap. He's a little hypotensive. He's got distended neck veins, and I can barely hear his heart sound, and this is what I see on ultrasound. Then, yes, you can tell me, I think this guy's got a tamponade. But you can't just show me this image and tell me the patient got tamponade right, because you can't diagnose it. Because you have patients, for example, who have cancer who develop a pericardial effusion and they do just fine. They don't have tamponade, all right? Or you can have patients that were under with a church, got stabbed in the chest, and have 50% less fluid than this and have distended neck vein and is hypotensive, all right, and has crappy looking EKG. So you can't, you, you can't grade the volume of fluid to say tamponade based on ultrasound. You gotta add the clinical picture to it, make sense? All right, always look at the clinical picture. Okay, good. There we have again, you can barely see the right ventricle here, all right, because something is happening that is bothering my preload. So I'm not getting a lot of blood into the heart, but I have a nice dilated left ventricle here, all right, and there's my effusion there. Doesn't mean the person has tamponade unless it comes to the clinical picture. And these little things that we call, these little comet tails looking things right here, this is what air does when you scan over the lungs. This is what it would look like, all right? There's a nice picture there, probably what my heart looks like. I doubt it. Um, but you can see a beautiful heart. This is a cardiac picture, okay? And if you put the ultrasound machine in cardiac mode, it will move your transducer indicator over here, and there's nothing you can do about it. Any machine that you put in cardiac mode, this is what it's gonna look like. But nonetheless, we know what we're looking at here. Nice thick wall of the left ventricle. Nice septum there. All right, there's your right ventricle. Right atria, left atria. All right, and a nice effusion around it. Nice effusion there, all right? So if you wanna be brave and stick a needle in this person's chest, you could do ultrasound guidance and get some of this fluid out, especially if they're in tamponade clinically. Okay, again, another one there. 
right atria, left atria, left ventricle, right ventricle, and a huge effusion. And of course, if this person has distended neck veins, crappy looking EKG, hypotensive, and you can't hear their heart sounds, that would be tamponade. All right, that's all I got. Any questions?